Well, thank you uh, very much for joining us uh, and good evening. It, there was Pat Benatar singing Invincible, a single released, I believe, in July 1985, when Boris Johnson was still at Oxford trying to get elected as president of the union and preparing for a career in levelling up social justice and a fair shake for all as a member of the famously egalitarian Bullingdon Club. Um, I'm Matt Dancona, I'm an editor at Tortoise, and the way we've decided to look back at the political term before the Commons recess begins on July the 22nd um, is really to boil down the inquest to a very simple question, which is, is Boris Johnson invincible? Um, in a genuine spirit of inquiry, because sometimes, quite frankly, in the newsroom, uh, digital or, or, or in real life, it seems to us that whichever way you cut it, he is. I mean, you look at the the, 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 the charge sheet, the rap sheet, his health secretary recently forced to resign, his home secretary found guilty of bullying by the standards advisor who then quit when his findings were ignored, the A-level disaster last summer, humiliated by the Supreme Court over the prorogation of parliament, forced into a messy uh, and unsustainable fudge on Northern Ireland and Brexit, that's precisely what he said wouldn't happen, evidence of a rampant democracy in the awarding of contracts, uh, dodginess over the decoration of the number 10 flat, his civil war with Dominic Cummings and the collapse, collapse of number 10 into nothing more than factional chaos, not to mention the small matter of the fast school mishandling of most aspects of COVID strategy other than the big one, I suppose, vaccines, from the care home scandal via test and trace to lockdown timing, and now the colossal gamble of uh, lifting COVID restrictions on July the 19th, even as Delta rages through the land. And I'm sure I've missed out many other examples. The list goes on and on. Um, and yet, as our co-founder, James Harney, put it in an open news meeting the other day, um, it often seems that this prime minister enjoys what James called a charisma exemption. Um, the, the normal rules just don't apply to him. And perhaps even that the media and his fellow politicians are using the wrong criteria and the met wrong metrics to judge his success and failure. Or is it all actually very brittle and hollow and perpetually on the brink of collapse, if only we could see it? It is, at the very least, a conundrum and one worth addressing. And we'd love to hear what you all think in, uh, and hope that you'll contribute to the chat, which is being presided over by uh, my colleague James Wilson tonight, I think. Um, and we have two fantastic speakers uh, to get us go going. Um, Gabby Hensliff, whose columns in The Guardian are, in my view and the view of many others, an absolute must read. And she's also a tortoise contributor. I, I do look at her brilliant file for us in March on Keir Starmer, which I, uh, for me, at any rate, is the best profile uh, by a handy margin yet written on the Labour leader. Um, she's an amazing political writer. Um, also Phil Collins, um, not only Tony Blair's former speechwriter, but also famously Tony Blair's favourite speechwriter, um, a regular contributor to Tortoise, a columnist elsewhere, an author of books, uh, a man of international mystery and many other accomplishments. Um, and we're grateful to both of them for sparing the time this evening. Um, Gabby, can I come to you first of all, um, and just sort of pose the the sort of the the question, which is, do you agree with the premise that different rules apply to Boris? I think it's hard to disagree with that premise when you see everything Boris Johnson has got away with, not just you know in office this time, but as mayor throughout his entire political career. He's like he's like a weeble, you know. You push him over and he just comes back again. There is it's a sort of no. I don't know how many times people have uh, pronounced Boris Johnson sort of dead and he um, comes sparking back to life. But at the same time, I think everyone's invincible until they're not, you know, and. Some people look as if they might go on forever and things always come to an end eventually. I, I think for now, the Labour Party is finding out what it felt like to be a Tory between about 1996 and 2006 when 
it felt as if no matter what Tony Blair did, if you were, you know, on the right, you felt, why, why can't people see it? Why can't people get it? And, you know, and that's exactly how the left feels about Boris Johnson. Now, surely, whatever the next disaster is, it's always, but surely this will be the one where people will see. And, you know, I, I think you're barking up the wrong tree if you think some, you know, additional piece of sleaze is going to bring him down or some. I think we've tested the theory that cabinet ministers in trouble will finish off Boris Johnson to destruction now. But I think there are scenarios in which Boris Johnson becomes vulnerable, none of which are probably as dependent on what Labour does as the Labour Party would possibly like to think. And I think those include a big economic event of some kind, whether that's a COVID yeah. recovery that fitters out or whatever it is. The second is probably trouble at the mill, you know, at home, your own backbench is turning on you for some reason, the electoral coalition that he's, he's built falling apart. But the other thing I wouldn't sort of underestimate is Johnson's capacity to just cock things up, which is the one that Dominic Cummings always refers to, you know, and, and it's, it's something that people who have worked closely with Boris at close quarters talk about more than people who haven't, you know, that capacity to make one disastrous mistake that unravels things. Do you think he was, I mean, he, he has a, a kind of um, not notorious capacity to be saved by good fortune when he's apparently at his lowest ebb. So having nearly died last year and, and really looked as if he was in serious trouble over the second wave, he was to a considerable extent um, given a reprieve, saved, how you want to phrase it, by the development and uh, regulatory approval of the vaccines, especially AstraZeneca. Um, Gabby, would, you know, do you think we'd be having a very different conversation this evening if the vaccines hadn't come through? Oh, of course we would. I mean, he was saved by the vaccine. We were all saved by the vaccine. Um, and if you think about where we'd have been, particularly at the beginning of this year, actually, when you know the new variant started to take off and if we'd been in that position in january and february with no vaccine nothing to get us out of it you know new variants going through the roof going back into lockdown and no you know no permanent answer to that i think we would have seen an entirely different political climate but that said i wouldn't have said i wouldn't have predicted before this year that you could you know a government could preside over sort of 130,000 odd people dying without apparently that inflicting any damage, you know, that 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 take, turns everything we think we know about how politics works on its head, because you'd think that would be the one thing people wouldn't forgive. And yet there continues to be this tendency to say, oh, he's doing his best, you know, he's it's it's hard, you know, it's difficult making decisions in a pandemic and he's, he's, he's done what he could. You know, people seem to have an extraordinary elastic tolerance for Boris Johnson. And I wonder if that's partly because the pandemic hasn't been economically tough at least on a lot of people no one's loved it you know we've all found it difficult staying at home we've all had you know anxious times over the last year but some people have emerged feeling more comfortable from this than they went into it if you've been able to save money you know while you were in lockdown and I think it's it's those economic circumstances changing which which potentially shift something yeah absolutely um just looking across the dispatch box at, at Starmer about whom you wrote so brilliantly um do you, do you think there are circumstances in which he personally conceivably can give that can, can at least give boris a run for his money um or, or has the public already made its mind up about Keir? because again the orthodox view now and it may or may not be true is that uh, party leaders get the figure varies from three months to six months to a year, but you know they get they get a limited period of of, of time, and of course this has been a slightly uh, very unusual uh, first period for an opposition leader because of the pandemic. But do, do you, what are your what is your sense of the a the 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 the, the problem Starmer is in, and b his capacity to to relaunch in the autumn and to make a good fist of it. It's unfair in a way, isn't it, to think that all the usual roles don't apply to, to Boris Johnson, but they do apply to everyone else. Exactly, you know, yeah. that, that somehow, you know, everything we thought we knew about, about opposition is true. I think there's a difference this time in that normally you do get one shot, people 
have their impression of you and then that becomes fixed and you never really escape it. I think because we've had a year of pandemic, almost solely pandemic politics, no domestic politics has come into the equation at all. When, if ever, please God, we do return at some point to non-pandemic politics and to sort of business as usual, I think there may in some ways be a sort of readjustment at that point because we all know almost nothing about what Keir Starmer thinks about anything apart from COVID. Um, so there is potentially, I suppose, a window there for him him to come in. But it looks as if they're fixed on, on two distinct tram lines at the moment and something would have to change, something quite unexpected would have to change to shift those. But what, what was interesting about your... Uh your deep dive into sort of Starmer's past was that it did rather dispel, well, it completely dispelled, in fact, the the, the notion that he's a he's a, just a suit, he's an empty mm. vessel. I mean, it, what it what it showed, I think, beyond reasonable doubt, was that um, that that Starmer is a person of considerable in principle and has he does have what Blair used to call an irreducible core of beliefs. So. The question is, can he translate those beliefs into a political project? Because, of course, what you do in the legal arena is not the same as what you do in the political arena at all. No, I mean, I think that that view, the more people I talk to about Kim Starmer, the more I moved away from the idea that he's someone who doesn't know what he thinks about things. Yes, he does know exactly what he thinks about things. And he tends to work through things from first principles. And he has certain core convictions which don't change. Um, but he, his thinking tends to be very nuanced. He is naturally inclined to see problems from all sides, which is an advantage in government, perhaps, because you can come at a difficult issue unexpectedly, you know, or you can, you can, you're good at weighing, you know, different views in the balance and the needs to please different people. But I think as a politician, you know, it's all primary colours. It's all, it's the difference between, you know, projecting from a stage to the back of the room and talking to the person who sat next to you. And you need to, almost your your views have to take on a sort of cartoonish flavour and texture if they're going to get across, you know, clearly to people who are kind of half listening and not really, you know, paying attention to politics most of the time. And that's what I felt he was struggling to do. That's what a lot of the legal colleagues I talked to um, felt he would struggle to do. You know, that he'd always been, he generally been a human rights lawyer. He wasn't convincing juries half the time. He'd been sort of engaged in intellectual debate with a judge rather than trying to sell an idea in very obvious primary terms to a bunch of people who weren't particularly concentrating, which is more what politics resembles. And that remains the, the difficulty, I think, top, just top with the fact that this is a time that would test any Labour leader, I think. The, the scale, I mean, you just put the slide up, the scale of what they have to do next time, the complexity of a picture where voters seem more volatile, very divorced from their old party allegiances, chopping and changing, there are small parties confusing the picture. We're in a weird time generally because of the pandemic. You know, dealing with all of that and with a sort of, you know, cratered hole that is what's left of the Labour Party after the last five years, that's asking, you know, you'd be asking a lot of the Messiah at that point, never mind Keir Starmer. Um, thanks, Gabby. We'll of course return to you. Um, Phil, you 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 wrote very striking for striking list for Tortoise um, in the aftermath of the immediate aftermath of the Batley and Spen by-election uh, victory for Labour, which Labour you know just nosed it. Um, that that you thought this was you know conceivably you were you didn't go overboard, but you thought conceivably this was. An important moment, and I wonder if you could elaborate on that. It was a very, very striking observation. Yeah, I thought it was an important moment because, I mean, firstly, because of the consequences. the The difference between a three hundred and twenty three vote victory and a three hundred and twenty three vote defeat are absolutely enormous. There's this yeah. huge gearing mechanism in by elections, which now all of a sudden, because he was three hundred and twenty three votes over the line. We say, ah, now he's free. He's got the summer to redefine himself. This moment that I agree, that Gabby said, is, will come when perhaps there might be another moment for Keir Starmer to put himself before the public. It's all now simply agreed that that's going to happen and that's OK. And the, the talk about Angela Rayner's putative leadership ambitions, they all go on ice. Whereas if it had been 323 votes the other way, of course, all, all hell would have broken loose. So it was very significant in that very local sense. But I thought it, it might be significant in a, in a wider sense too, which is that we're in the early stages of a, of a kind of brand new dispensation in politics. The, uh, the affiliation, which was once essentially material, is now essentially cultural. I mean, I'll simplify a little bit. 
but we've seen a shift in the motivation of voting behavior, which has been coming for a long time, but it's now there. And Brexit really accelerated it. And uh, in the 2019 election, that's what we had. That, those are circumstances which are very inhospitable for the Labour Party, because the, the, the urban educated vote is horribly split. Notably in Scotland, it doesn't go to the Labour Party. So the Labour Party is psychologically ill-equipped to give up on the idea of its old heartlands. And also mathematically, it can't do so because it can't win without it. So it's got a very uneasy coalition. It's much harder for Keir Starmer than it was for Tony Blair because Blair can position himself and did repeatedly on the political spectrum and say, essentially behind me, I have the industrial working class who are the bedrock vote. And the idea of aspiration means I'll go further and further up the income scale and you can still vote Labour because it's safe to do so. That is a comparatively easy political sales pitch. Whereas what you're, when you're trying to combine somebody who thinks gay marriage is entirely reasonable and in fact obvious and someone who thinks it's an abomination, that's really, really hard. These are trench trenches that we're in. And so that's a difficult coalition to, to bridge. And the reason I thought Batman and Spen might be interesting is that if you simply aggregated the pro-Brexit vote from 2019, one of which was a local independent running on the heavy woolen district independence, and the other was the, the Brexit party. And that then was given to the Tory party, as indeed had more or less happened in Hartlepool. That should have made that seat a comfortable conservative victory. And that's without reckoning on Galloway stripping away some of the uh, Labour vote. So I thought it was really hard for Labour to win. And therefore, that victory was a notable one, I think. And it's, it doesn't mean it's a harbinger of other things to come, but coupled with Chesman, Chesman and Amersham, where the Tories suffered what to them was a surprise defeat to the Liberal Democrats, I think it showed you the new politics in operation. And it doesn't necessarily always have to end in defeat for the progressive left. I think it certainly showed that. So it has a symbolic importance too in, in, in raising morale and making people think, oh gosh, it's, it's not hopeless, it can be done. Do you think, I mean, it's interesting you reference Chesham and Amersham because perfectly reasonably, um, Ed Davey quite literally presented that as a breakthrough of the blue wall and by implication as a moment when Boris's uh, rather, you know, hodgepodge coalition um, had been shown to be fragile. I'm very interested in what you think about that because the Conservative coalition you know, long before Blair built the Big Ten, the Conservative Party had always been constructed of coalitions between quite unlikely constituents. So, you know, the, the, the 80s had owed as much to what, what might be called the, the, you know, the kind of Shire Tory paternalist voters who continue to stay loyal to the party and the new um, breed of Tory voters who were famously described as Essex man, who were entrepreneurial, who wanted the freedom to own their own council houses and the new liberties and so on. Um, the question is, I suppose, that I, I'd love to know what you think about is, is there, is there really a Boris coalition that, 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 that amounts to anything other than affection for him of, of, certain, of a certain sort and a view that Brexit, even if you didn't like it, had to be done and if you did like it, certainly had to be done. Is, yeah. is it really a coalition? I think it is a rock solid coalition on an issue that's going to go away, which is to say <laughs> Brexit. So I, I do think your point about Boris Johnson himself is very important. And I want to come back to that because whilst I don't think he's invincible, I do think he's formidable. I think we do need to register his virtues because they're significant. And the principally, he he's, has political character. He has a definable character. And that's something that most politicians would kill for. And he really has that. But his coalition was founded on Brexit. And for all those of us on the other side of that argument, it's been disconcerting to realise that every time the Brexit argument is put to an electoral test, it's incredibly powerful and it always wins. But that appeal is fading because Boris Johnson has gone and done something really foolish that he should never do in politics. And he's succeeded and he's lost his issue. The, the idiot has gone and got Brexit done. 
when what he needed for his electoral success was always to be on the verge of getting Brexit yes. done, with people threatening to stop it. That that's like Nicholas Sturgeon's position in Scotland. Well, that was his plan in 2016, wasn't he? To have lost the referendum and to be the champion of sort of Euroscepticism. Precisely, precisely. But his great failure is he keeps winning. And <laughs> how on earth, how on earth does he then uphold this winning position? Because his cause, although Brexit, obviously, I, I understand as an economic event, will will reverberate for a long time. But as a political event, its great force will will decline. Has already declined. That fact has been covered over by a second unlikely and unfortunate cause in the pandemic, which, as Gabby said before, is rather frozen politics for 18 months or so. If and when that goes, which hopefully it will soon, I think then the question becomes very acute, which is, does he have a cause which can unite a coalition? The only candidate he has so far is the thin, thin and ill-defined idea of levelling up which, as you said in your introduction, is, is hardly the thing that brought him into politics. And I know from being part of a government that tried to do a lot of this, it's incredibly difficult mm. with the best will in the world and all the money that was available in a time when we didn't have a huge trauma in the public finances. It is nevertheless extremely difficult to make a difference to, to places which are on the receiving end of globalization's down forces. So when... Whether he can, it's conceivable that he can make any progress at all on levelling up in the time available, I rather doubt. And even if he does, the things he would have to do in order to level up would threaten some parts of his coalition because the expenditure will cause all kinds of internal ructions within the Conservative Party. And I think you know, we've already touched on the prospect that an economic downturn might prove very difficult. I think conflicts with the Chancellor may well also prove to be a very, uh, fairly conventional political problem for the Prime Minister. It, it, this is proving uncanny because that was going to be my, my next question to you, which is, um, it seems to me that masked by the, um, the sort of the, the, the poll and polling figures and the general sense that COVID is the principal issue, which I suppose, to be fair, it is, it, there is a fundamental split in this government, which is um, doctrinal, actually, over fiscal issues and, and you know you have in Rishi Sunak uh, someone who was meant to be a number 10 stooge and far from it has emerged as quite a strong uh, continuity force of, of fiscal conservatism versus a prime minister who wants to borrow and spend and and loves building bridges and uh, hurling money at projects even if like the garden bridge they don't come good now, now, Phil, you, you, you know, you've been part of a government where you know, the, the, the tensions between number 10 and number 11 were, to say the least, you know, uh, clear and present. Um, what, what do you, how do you rate the, 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 the tensions ahoy between number 10 and 11 in, in this instance? Well, I think in the, the Blair and Brown years, they were essentially tensions about ambition, and yeah. political place, which were then dressed up and dignified as, as though they were doctrinal. We used to search for doctrinal differences. And you, although you could dance on the head of the pin and find them, they weren't the source of the differences. In this case, I agree with the premise of your question that the difference is genuine and serious and, and sort of intellectual, to give it a, a, a probably excessively dignified term, because there are two different views of the world here. Rishi Sunak is an authentic and conventional fiscal conservative. Um, who, wants, who ideally would like to balance the books and would like to repair the public finances. And Boris Johnson cannot see anything that he wants to stop spending money on and can see lots of things that he wants to, carry, to spend more money on. And I think something has to give here because I think we're, what we're getting to is a point you got to with Gabby, which is about do the rules apply to Boris Johnson? And his great skill, his great brilliance as a politician is that he is able to defy the rules for quite a long time. And that is a fantastic thing to be able to do. The, the Tamils have a brilliant phrase for it, which is that you want to wear the moustache but drink the porridge. And <laughs> it, it's a real mark of Boris Johnson that not only could you imagine him doing that, you could imagine him saying it. I mean, that's the sort of thing he says, and, he, and he's vivid and interesting. And this is a great character trait, and it allows you to gloss over contradictions for quite a long time, but not forever. So in the end, I think the fact that he isn't very good at government and the fact that he genuinely doesn't have 
um, is not on the same page as his chancellor on, the, on such a big question as public spending, it, it is absolutely bound to matter. And Sunak is a really critical person in this. And how they manage that tension when it comes is going to be very, very interesting. I thought it was fascinating that, and maybe this is just my cynical mind, but that in the week of all the uh, cabinet marriages falling apart, uh, Rishi acquired a dog. It seemed to be something semiotically significant. <laughs> I'm a stable family man. Um, thanks for all. We'll come back to you. Uh, I'd like to go to some people who've been um, putting some fascinating, some fascinating uh, points in the chat. And I, I really want to catch up with some of them. Um, did, uh, could we go to Helena Sofranievich, um, who uh, had a very good point to make, I think, about the, dis the, the sheer difference of Boris? Helena, I don't know if you're there, but it's, I think it was, a, it was very well made, your observation. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think, well, someone put it, a point in the chat that, um, that kind of different rules apply to populist politicians like Johnson and Trump and the likes of them. Um, but, and they say that people are, like that are elected because or in spite of their faults. But I think it is, precisely because of those faults that Johnson is elected. And I think he consciously plays to them and flaunts them as a means of presenting himself as a quote unquote common man. Um, it makes him very relatable to a set of voters whose reality is so detached from his, much in the same way that Farage did with the whole pints around Brexit. Um, and actually I just put something in that I was reading about um, how Johnson is performatively badly dressed. Um, and it's a way of both showing that he uh, has a lot on his plate, he's got too much to do to think about how he dresses in the day, but also it's a way of connecting to an electorate that supposedly, or he assumes, does not really care about fashion or presentation. Um, so I think all of these things that we talk about are, are part of a political effect, really, effect with an Um and I don't think we should ever, I think the dangerous thing is to dismiss him and to dismiss others as clowns. No, absolutely. I mean, it seems to me that uh, one of the great things that populist leaders have is a is a um, an ability to communicate to the voters that they despise politics as much as the voters do, which is a a kind of a, a loop argument, but one that does seem to pay off. And I think also, also, Matt, I could just say it's important to point out that clowns are not clowns either. They're people dressed up as clowns. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's what Johnson's doing. It's a, it is a it's sometimes a clown act. But you're right, I agree. That doesn't mean to say he's a clown. I mean, you, you don't become prime minister, like first mayor of London against the trend and then prime minister without, and, and actually just be a clown and nothing else. I mean, I have to say Labour has yet to put up anybody good against it. it part of his fabled luck is that he only ever faces Ken Livingston or Jeremy Corbyn so far. So we've yet to see. It's a bit like England going through the European Championships. We haven't met anyone good yet. And let's see how, how it goes when we meet a good team. But he does have that capacity to sort of generate the rules as he goes. And that is something incredibly formidable as a politician. So I, I rate him really highly in a way, much as I don't like him and much as I think the critique of him is true. And in the end, we'll get him. But for the time being, he can defy gravity. Can I just say as well, just to really quickly piggyback off Phil, um, what you were just saying about the Sunak-Johnson dynamic, I think is really interesting. And just going back to what I was saying about being performatively badly dressed, I find it very op uh, interesting that Sunak is almost the complete opposite of that. We see him as someone who's very polished, who's very conscious of his appearance. And I don't doubt at all that that dynamic is, is just as manufactured, it's just as purposeful. He squeaks when he moves, he's so ambitious. Um... <laughs> Can I come to my colleague Tessa Murray? Tessa, you, you've been um, making some really interesting points, but one in particular at the start, you, you, you made a little sort of list of economic trouble ahoy, which I thought was rather compelling. Oh, really? Let me scroll back, Matt. Um, uh, yeah, so I think we've been talking about why, <clears throat> why Boris hasn't, uh, has been sort of untouchable to date. So I was just doing a little bit of forward thinking to, you know, next, well, end of the year, next year, when the government support for business comes off. Um, and frankly, I think business stops being quite so nice to everybody as it's had to be during the pandemic. So you see probably job losses coming in, possibly um, 
you know, rising inflation, possibly interest rates to try and do some of um, Sunak's sort of fiscal balancing that he'd like to do. You put all of that into a cocktail mixer and you've got an economic backdrop that looks a bit choppy, to say the least. Um, and probably, as we've been talking about earlier, that, that, that acts like an anvil <clears throat> on the tension between number 10 and 11 in terms of spending. Um, but I think that will be really interesting. Um, and, I, and I wonder how much when things really come home to roost for individuals, and the, and, a, and the vaccine success has already been priced into the market. You know, you can no longer sort of ride the crest of that particular wave. Um, you're left with somebody who has got us in, in an excess death mess, economically unstable. People, the kind of the echoes of austerity will, will come back going, we're not, we're not carrying the buck for this one again. Um, and I think that will be a political environment that might challenge him. I mean, what's very, uh, is, the reason I think what you're saying is so interesting is that um, everyone is slightly baffled that all of the sleaze and apparent corruption and um, sexual adventurism doesn't seem to be impacting on the polls at all. Um, but actually, if you look back to the 90s with the back to basics, um, sleaze and similar uh, problems that John Major had, um, it, it was really because of Black Wednesday yeah. that, it, that, that they, think, yeah. they, they meshed with a sense of public impatience and, and weariness with Tory incompetence. And the personal behaviour um, gelled with that sense of how the government was behaving you know, day to day. And so I think that all of the things that we think that Boris is getting away with, may, he may not get away with in a different context. I mean, that... This is purely speculative, but I, I don't think that you can assume that he's he's absolutely ninety five percent immunity. You know, double dose um, uh, um, Pfizer immunity to any of these things. It, it's it's way too early to say that. Um, and Matt, you're a much better historian than I am. <laughs> Just understatement of the year. Um, but <laughs> you, um, too early to say. It, hey, it's too early to say. I think I think we can bet the house on that one. But um, isn't it also historic, in, in, historically, that sort of the revolutions happen as you come out of the U? They don't happen at the worst moment. They happen as you're coming coming out of the family, the kind of because people go, hang on. Yeah, where in they? theory, people are too exhausted in the sort of middle of the, yeah. whatever the crisis was. It's as you come out of it and things it's are changing. Just normal and they're not normal fast enough and that's when people lose it. I mean, that's in a sense, that's why... I made economics the sort of first the first thing that 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 could undo him because there are so many sort of multiple forces coming in potentially on the horizon. And it's not just all the obvious ones you can think of, like, you know, the failure of a COVID recovery. You know, don't rule out the possibility of some left field shock like we had in 2009, you know, another banking collapse or an oil shock or a play, you know, ship gets wedged in the Panama Canal and you never knew what a little knock on, you know, thing that would have on on trade around the world or the impacts of Brexit, you know, all of those things. And also the impact, I think, on public services. I mean, we're looking at rising NHS waiting times for years to come, I think, as you try to get to grips with, you know, the NHS tries to catch up with all those, those COVID cases. And you're looking at potentially, a, a, you know, appreciable deterioration and chaos in schools for another two years, because I think we're probably gonna be in and out still of, you know, kids being off school and all the rest of it. You can just see a sort of gradual depreciation of public services that people experience in their everyday life coming at the same time as government's not got money to throw around on it. And, and as Matt was saying, I think people are very tolerant of, you know, sleaze and affairs and snogging your mistress in the Department of Health if, if things are going generally okay for them in their own lives. But when their own lives are being affected in appreciable, noticeable daily ways, and the government appears to be, you know, whiling away its time doing who knows what, that's when the two things come together. It's like, this hurts me personally. What are you doing about it? Oh, nothing. Exactly. Um, could we go to Sam Houston, who uh, I think is here. Sam, are you about? Or do you want? Hello. Hi, how are you? Yeah, great, thanks. Good to see you. You, you made a point earlier, Sam, in, in the chat about the different rules applying to populist leaders generically. And I just wondered whether you think, are there limits to that? 
I mean, is is do you um, look to a post-populist time, or is this now the new? Please. I mean, but I mean, do, in other words, clear, his, politics doesn't go back. You know, there, there is no, there's no such thing as a successful restorationist project. It it, it always moves forward in some way or other. Um, it, it, so what follows the populist era and, and how does it help those who are seeking to dislodge Boris? Uh, can you not make an ar argument that it goes back and forth, you, you know, in a sort of... I, I'm, I, I'm personally a great... This, I'm, I don't have any faith in the pendulum because I think... The, the Blair, Peter Hennessy pendulum. Blair learned from Thatcher, Cameron learned from Blair. I think you... Politics is sequential rather than adversarial, but others may disagree. Yeah, I kind of disagree with that, and I kind of hope that that, that, that we can return to some sort of um, rationality, or, or or at least a, some some further rationality. I think, you know, I still hope. I, Nico made some really good points uh, about Labour's coalition, which is absolutely right, and 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 Keir Starmer is not, you know, uh, in my view, as charismatic as Tony Blair was, and and this is not the same time as that. But 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 I do feel that that, that sooner or later we're gonna we're gonna pe people are gonna want competence and integrity again, um, particularly, you know, perhaps more so not disparaging the, the states, but perhaps more so in this country than the states. Uh, I was speaking to an American person the other day who was saying that, that they're so irreparably divided in the states at the moment that they you know they really can't see any way forward but 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 here I don't I don't feel that it's it's like that and I you know I, I still entertain fond hopes that you know I, I want to see uh, Keir Starmer be prime minister frankly I, you know I want him to have a chance to be prime minister uh, and I think there's enough time left in this parliament uh, for, for some of the numerous numerous things that people have said to, to, to catch up with Boris Johnson and his government um, as has already been happening and he's got you know at least one uh, last large enemy out there. Um, so I, I think um, we, we can see a return to a kind of a, a slightly more rational and um, uh, uh, accountable type of politics. Um, yeah, I, I kind of do believe in the pendulum in a way. It's very, very interesting. Um, can we come to um, uh, Andrew Girdwood now? Hi. Hi, Andrew. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Uh, you made a, a a point about culture wars and culture yeah. wars has been something we've been very interested in towards us uh, uh, and, and following with some concern. Um, it's, it's obviously now embedded into the political sort of landscape, isn't it? Um, yeah. Partly organically, partly by uh, design. Um, number 10 is obviously trying to rev it up. Do you think that it's too late to re reel that back or are we going to be watching um, often quite phony conflicts sort of filling the screens and, and our Twitter feeds and the pages of newspapers. I think it is too late to reel it back. And I think we will see phony fights about it on TV because it's too late to reel it back. So that's the battleground. And so that's where they will fight. So, okay, if that's the case, what have you got? You've got Boris Johnson offering a pretty bog standard, you know, uh, English nationalist, patriotic history is not there to be uh, meddled with, retain and explain on statues, uh, wokeness is driving us all crazy offer. Okay, I mean, that's, you know, it's very, it's not hard to, it's not new and it's not imaginative, but it's, it's there. Yep. And then on the other side, you have um, the social justice movements who have equally strong views on a whole range of things and oftentimes um, I think take the bait from uh, number 10. So is that all we're going to see from now on? Just a kind of, um, you know, two bald men arguing over a comb? I think Phil Collins nailed it when he said that um, Johnson shouldn't have won Brexit because that means he's got nothing to do. So what's the next target? It's the culture wars, which you cannot win. And therefore, he's he, got he's, his. He can't, that, that's really. Oh, it's, it's exactly. You aren't going to give up. You're not going to. You're, you're not going to. I hope there's at least a chunk of the United Kingdom who will forever defend women's rights and trans rights and gay wedding and all those things that, that, that are is considered woke. No, I, I, don't, I, I don't doubt. I don't doubt for a minute that uh, that's true. Um, 
I, I do wonder whether the the electoral map would would support that contention in terms of actually you know winning an election in other words you're right that there's a there's a core decency out there and there's a core belief in uh, tolerance and and there is a resistance to i think there's a very strong resistance to some aspects of english nationalism whether that translates into a, a kind of embrace of everything that the social justice movements are calling for i wonder no i, I you're right um the electrical map, electrical map doesn't support it therefore johnson will continue to win because the opponents are not only not strong enough but they are divided they are fragmented scotland's going to s and labor no longer gets their votes Labour has lost confidence with some people who are voting Liberal. We've seen that in the by-elections. And so, if you look, I, I mean, I think it was, it was the Treaty of Washington, wasn't it? Between Washington and Japan, when the Americans split their, their, their navy, one side of the country and the other side of the country, forgetting that half the navy was still smaller than the Japanese navy. So that's what Johnson has managed to do. He, he split the opposition into smaller units of which his supporters will always outvote. So... I think Johnson is the, the, the talisman. He's not a politician. The only way he will lose is if his side loses faith in his, 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 his position as the totem, at which point he'll be replaced by another totem. But yeah, I think I, I can't see a way out of the cultural wars. I mean, the, 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 only, the only sort of ray of hope I've seen on that front in terms of internal dissent, which I think is the key on this, is that... To my surprise, his backbenchers, or a significant number of them, are resisting the cut in development aid. Yeah. Now, you know, the, that, that cut is, 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 I don't know what the opposite of virtue signaling is, but that's what it is. Um, you know, in the great scheme of things, in the amount of money that we've been spending on COVID recovery, you know, it's absurd. It's and, the and, um, Ian Duncan Smith today is saying he, he thinks the, 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 Top up the disability top up that they're reviewing today was what is wrong. Yeah, I, I nearly fell off my chair when I heard that. Ian Duncan Smith. I mean, I would, I would have thought you said you, you should have taken more off. We should claw back the difference. I wasn't expecting him to say you should you should you should leave it. Yeah. No. So I, it, it it is. I I, I, did, I mean, one of the things about the the eighty seat majority that's interesting is that um, it looks impregnable and it, it may be impregnable at a general election moment but in, in in the house of commons it can be quite frangible so i i, I actually think to your point andrew that, that you know oddly enough the people who may start to have misgivings about some of the more egregious aspects of tory culture wars are, are other tories which is a very odd reflection um yeah. anyway we'll see um i wonder if we can come to uh lucy lucy huberman or i see it's there um Lucy, hi, how are you? I'm okay, this is totally good, good to see you. Um, you. You've had lots to say this evening. I, 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 don't, I don't want to script you, but you, but you, did, you did start off by mentioning the culpability of the media, and I think it would be wrong not, to, you know, um, given that you, you know, there's me and, and two hacks, as it were, up here. Someone should speak up, for the, uh, speak up for the sins of the media and all this, such as they are. Okay, so the media obviously isn't all one group, and I'm accepting everybody on this call for my comments. Phew. <laughs> Thank you very much. I agree with Thank you then. You. <laughs> <laughs> so not to what else I have to say. But um, yeah, I, I've been really, really intrigued. I'm sorry, this is going to take a rather tabloid turn now by the use of photography by the tabloids in the last year. And I, sorry, it may sound facile, but it started last summer with all of those Photoshop photos of Boris's holiday and the tent and the fence and the security guys. And it was so obviously all set up that I realized then that whatever he did, you know, whatever he did, we weren't going to get to grips with it, even in any... You know, there was so much analysis offline about these photographs that were so fascinating. And then the baby that changed size, size so often and, um, you know, unchronologically changed size. And the photograph that really got me was Gavin Williamson with the whip on his desk. 
sort of long shot. I I've got the whip. I've got the black book. There's nobody. The knowledge I know where the skeleton. There's nobody who can get me. And there's obviously so much else that maybe could be reported. But even though sleaze, you know, maybe not a factor. I just don't know why people aren't dishing the dirt at this point. There's so much. You know, let, let me ask a question, Lucy, which is very, uh, very germane to all this, which is that it is true that um, Westminster, you know, what Dominic Cummings calls SW1, the, yeah. the media elite, whatever you want to call it, oftentimes does know a lot more about these private life issues uh, than, than they publish. And they circle around them because the, the actually the rules governing that sort of thing are, are more complicated, not just on a legal level, but in terms of the code, children and so on, um, than one might think. But do you actually think in your heart of hearts that we are too craven as a, as a, as a profession? In other words, to maintain access, we, we don't, say what we should do, which is just, this is what's happening. You should know about it. And I thought that before this government, because of the lobby and because of um, systems and, you know, the rather poor press regulation that we have. And I'm sorry, I should say, I'm on the UK Advisory Committee of the Ethical Journalism Network, which is a tiny charity that has very little reach at the moment but no it's a but it's a fine one it's a fine one it is a fine should... one it's got full of good people and we do some can you put can you put the link to it in the in the yeah, chat I will. Be great. I, 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 sorry, sorry, I'm sorry just, to finish, no, go ahead. just to finish i think it was the same in your discussion about the royals i think there is a lot to say and a lot of reporting that can be done not necessarily about the royal family but about the staff of the palace you know, that there, there is a lot that could be investigated that wouldn't break the rules. It might damage access, yes. And it's hard, so what? It's hard, it's hard. Gabby, you wanted to come back in, I think. Yeah, I was just, I mean, I, I appreciate that you have exempted us from this criticism, but I was a lobby reporter for 13 years. And um, I know what you're talking about when you say that um, you're constantly, you know, thinking, you know, you're, you're aware in your head always that, that what you write potentially affects your access. And, but also you're balancing that against the fact that, you know, nobody ever made a great career out of writing boring stories that were just what the government wanted to hear. So, you know, there are pressures in competing directions. And I wouldn't underestimate how much you do just want to get the killer story. But I do, I sometimes feel as a slight false comfort in thinking if only people knew the truth about what this government was, all the awful things they were doing, you know, they would finally, the scales would fall from their eyes. Given what we already know that's in the public domain already, if you haven't by now concluded that Boris Johnson is a bit of a wrong one, you know, I, I'm not quite sure what else, what else people need to know at this point beyond what we already know about the 50 billion mistresses and the love children and the this and the that and the entire history of, you know, lying and um, cheating and scamming your way through life. You know, I don't, I sort of feel beyond that, what is it that people are missing? That's the piece that slots into the picture and they go, aha, when, when you know, this happened, when Dominic Cummings was disappeared off to, to Barnard Castle in the middle of lockdown, I didn't, it didn't sink in then that they weren't handling this thing properly. But now, you know, now I see it. It's almost not, you can give people as much information as they like and you see it with, you know, you see it on all sides. I think if you think about the way in which Corbynites stuck by Jeremy Corbyn through some pretty terrible allegations, you know, when people don't want to believe something or hear something of someone they've invested in, they won't hear it. The question is, why are people so invested in Boris Johnson? What is it that, that he's got or he's delivering that somehow makes it worth all that, you know, that makes people able to put all of that stuff to the back of their minds? And that's what I don't think Labour's got to the bottom of. What is it? And it's not a question the left asks itself often enough, I think, about Boris Johnson is, what, what is it that he's got over people? What is the hold? What is the draw? What is he offering that somehow makes all this worthwhile? I don't think we understand that well enough. No, I'm sure I'm absolutely right. Um, and and uh, I, I think it's true that you have to learn from previous prime ministers before you can go on to be the next one. 
uh, even if you don't actually model yourself on them directly. Um, could, could we come to Katie Vanek Smith, um, Tortoise co founder, uh, uh, who I think had some interesting points to make about culture wars? Katie, I don't know if you're still on the call. Perhaps. Uh, I am oh, on a train. On a train. There you go. There's a responsible <laughs> citizen. There's a co founder what? to be proud of. Um, what? <laughs> Uh, no, I just I the point you made about culture wars, I think, was 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 very interesting. I was just picking up on what Phil said, really, about the fact that he, you know, the the, the fault of picking Brexit is that Brexit he, he lost he lost it when he won it, as it were, when he delivered it. And I just feel that I don't know in the culture wars debate what what winning entails, and so maybe that's why it is. A very clever play of Boris, but I don't know because I I don't really understand what they think the winning of a culture war, war looks like. So maybe Phil would have a point of view on that and be able to explain it to me in my mask on a train. I think it's war without end, really. Um, although whether people will have a taste for it for that long, I, I wonder. Phil, do you want to come back in on? That and other matters. Yeah, I think it is a war without end, but I don't think it's one that they'll find difficult to wage because I think it's really thin. I think that once you get beyond something enormous like Brexit, to try and find cognate issues that you can divide the country over again in exactly the same way and turn out exactly the same coalition is in fact really hard because finding you can find things to divide people on, but you've got to find things on which they really care on which they'll continue to exercise their vote. And I think that's gonna look pretty thin and pretty unlikely in the midst of really troubled economic times. So I do think that some of the ordinary rules of politics will reapply, which is that the obvious thing that people's living circumstances are vitally important. So though I think they will try to keep the culture wars going, and I think that will be depressing and awful and the left, by which I mean the Labour Party, should continue to resist being drawn in, I don't think ultimately it has the power for Boris Johnson that, that it has had hitherto. So I think it will increasingly look like a slightly desperate tactic. In fact, I think it look, already looks quite desperate. I mean, I could not care less if Robert Jenrick wants to wear the Union Jack when he's on interviews on the BBC. I, I just don't care. I'm not going to be angry about it. I just think he's a bit of a dick. And the you're a bit of a dick for making a thing of this will eventually overpower the entirely confected idea of no, arguments about whether it's right for us all to have Union Jacks behind us as we talk. And it's going to be continuously difficult to have culture war issues which are genuine without the Tory party really getting into a place it doesn't want to get into. Because if it really, really goes hard against anti-woke, it's going to find itself in places that will alienate the people of Chesham and Amersham. And so the politics of this, and by no means easy. And the, the problem I, I started by saying the Labour Party has, the Conservative Party has too, which is if you're on one side, if you are satisfying one side of your cultural flank, you are really annoying the other side of it. And I thought it was very interesting about in Spen what Galloway did, because Galloway, I think, very intriguingly took votes from the Tories with a really strong anti-woke message. And I thought, what the Labour Party needs to do, they need Galloway to stand everywhere, because he, of course, he'll take away some votes from Labour, but he's a really effective campaigner for the pro-Brexit anti-woke vote, which otherwise would go to the Conservative Party. So he's, he's a, I mean, he's a double agent. I mean, let's have him everywhere. And I think the Tories are going to find it difficult to keep this running. So although I find it dispiriting that we're going to have to keep having these things. And, and indeed, I mean, Kate is wearing a mask. That will be the next issue, won't it, on which we have... Hey, Mark, 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 masking is, is the new Brexit. It is, uh, yeah. It, I, was, I was dismayed and amused in parts by... There was a piece in The Telegraph today um, objecting to an entirely blameless charity uh, song uh, video that David Baddiel and a bunch of comedians did to raise money for the NHS. And if you've not seen yeah. it, it's, it's basically saying you know, can't wait to go back to the way it was before, it was crap. Um, and obviously they're joking, but it was, <laughs> taken, you know, it's a, it's a sure sign of, of the rise of fundamentalism, as Chris Fitch has used to say, that people start being literalists. And it's quite obvious that it was what used to be called in the old days a joke. 
Um, <laughs> uh, but it was the Telegraph sold it as, you know, snide, woke, uh, evil, wicked, communist, Maoist, cultural Marxist, <laughs> Indians, plan overthrow of Britain with charity single. And I just thought, this is funny now, but three years from now, we may be finding it a bit, uh, a bit wearying. Uh, yeah. Gabby, is there anything you want to add um, before we reach the end of the hour? Yeah, no, just th just that we always end up, I mean, it's fascinating to discuss culture wars. I get sucked into it. Everyone gets sucked into it. They're always hot button issues you want to talk about. I think we can really overstate how important it is and how many people actually engage in it. I mean, if you look at the polling, it shows you roughly, Ipsos Mori's done some great stuff on it. You've got about a quarter of the population that really is the sort of, you know, Brexit, sort of pro-Brexit, political correctness has gone mad, blah, 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 um, reactionaries. You've got about a quarter that are, you know, woke liberals rising to the bait. And you've got the other 50% going, oh, God, is there anything on the other channel? You know, that it's <laughs> not really interested or engaged and not easily pigeonholed. And would actually like to hear something, I think, about health or housing or education or transport or, you know, a thing that might actually get you somewhere. And I'm not sure that they're being sufficiently engaged at the moment. And I think if you engage those people with something big and substantial, you can get away with sometimes being, you know, the fact you will continue, wherever you are on a culture wars, you're alienating someone. You can get away with that if you've got the other 50%. Yeah, I, I think if you're trying to set up a sort of Emmanuel Goldstein figure, um, someone as brilliant and lucid as Sethnam Sankara is not a very good choice. That would just be my memo to um, <laughs> number 10. Um, Look, there are, we all have um, a match to go to uh, digitally, principally, I assume. Um, uh, and I don't want to keep anyone any longer. Um, it's been a fantastic event. I, I've learned a lot. Um, I mean, just very to summarize very briefly, it's clear that Boris is in a very strong position, but uh, perhaps more frangible than we imagine. Um, his backbenchers are restive. Um, and I think Gabby made a very good point in saying that Starmer um, may well, because of the oddity of the situation, have at least one last chance to relaunch in the autumn. Um, I loved Phil's point about the, the disaster of winning Brexit, which I think is, is, is genius and really uh, explains all the problems that are now baked into Boris's future. Um, I take Helena's point that there's a uh, you know, he is a different kind of politician, but Sam may well also be right that 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 we will we will tire of that different kind of politician and 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 crave a return to competence and credentialism. I I agreed with Tessa that the you know we haven't really seen Boris in a in a testing economic context and especially one where he's explicitly rather than implicitly at war with a very ambitious uh, chancellor who sees the world completely different. Um, and it's interesting to me that at the moment all roads do seem to lead um, it's sometimes interestingly other times wearingly to uh, to culture wars I think Katie is spot on in saying that there's no end point and Andrew's right that you know uh, the the they, they will continue unless we get bored with them or unless something intervenes um, it's always worth bearing in mind that Churchill did lose the election after the war and um, shares can go uh, down as well as up. So perhaps invincible, it's an exaggeration. Uh, it may be how it looks today, but you can bet that the picture a year from now will be radically different. Thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you so much to Phil and Gabby for being such brilliant speakers. And thanks to everyone who's joined in in the chat and elsewhere. Have a fantastic evening. I imagine a few of you may well be going off to uh, watch a football match. Uh, fingers crossed for uh, the three lions and we'll see you all again very soon. Have a great evening.